This week on The Bioneers. We have protocols against race discrimination. And we have protocols against gender discrimination. But unless there is a concerted effort to bring them together, many of the women who should be protected will fall through the cracks. We hear from attorney Kimberly Crenshaw on intersectionality, a prism that allows us to analyze a range of social problems and ensure inclusive remedies on Bioneers Radio. Support for the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is provided in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms and by the generous support of listeners like you. When Barack Obama was elected as the nation's first African-American president, Many heralded the historic moment as the dawn of a post-racial society. Instead, his election provoked an equal and opposite reaction, where for centuries, whiteness had been the implicit default position underlying society's institutions and structures. Now whiteness was emerging as its own identity politics. That racialized ferment drove a head-spinning political reversal when Donald Trump rode the wave of white anxiety into the White House. It was a backlash that revealed an increasingly open and explicit white nationalism, one nation, separate and unequal. In a kind of reverse affirmative action, it revived an overtly exclusionary agenda, Roll back rights and protections for the non-white other in all its forms, people of color, immigrants, Muslims, women, and gay and transgender people. Then came the backlash to the backlash, a rapidly spreading awakening that all these peoples, movements, and struggles are actually connected in one story. What would it mean if only at the crossroads of these many identities will we find a story big enough to embrace the diversity and complexity of our brave new globalized 21st century world. A tall order indeed. In this half hour, we hear from visionary law professor and changemaker Kimberly Crenshaw. She weaves seemingly disparate issues, peoples, and movements into one common story. And she says the unifying thread is the crossroad where issues such as race, gender, and class intersect with one another. This is Backlash Moment, converging at the crossroads of identity and justice. I'm Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Poseidon Adventure, where people were, <laughs> you know, trying to get out, but most people were going in the opposite direction, like five people survived at the end. There's a way in which this post-racialism kind of feels like that, like so many people were going in the opposite direction, and now the question is, where are we? Is there a morning after? Kimberly Crenshaw is professor of law at UCLA and Columbia Law School. In 1996, she co-founded an innovative think tank, the African American Policy Forum, to bring together academics, activists, and policymakers who could strategize on how to dismantle structural inequality. According to Crenshaw, one of the gnarliest obstacles is the illusion of post-racialism and how it's being manipulated to perpetuate inequality. What happened to Barack Obama has happened to us as a society at large. We lost for at least six years any real contemporary conversation about how racism is playing out. So generally when racism comes up, people think Bull Connor. They think segregation. They think individual level animus. They don't think structures. They don't think institutions. They don't think about the environment. They don't think about all the ways that racial power is still playing out. Some part of what post-racialism has done has taken questions of racism off the table, but not questions of race. So you can still talk about race as an explanatory justification for inequality, but you can't call that talk racist. So when Trump talks about the inner city being a dark, dangerous place, that's race talk. Right? He's basically saying that there's a whole group of us and where we live is a dangerous, dark jungle and you don't want to go there. Right? That's race talk. But if we were to say that's racist, that would be called racist 
to call that racist because mm -hmm. to actually say that, that any kind of racial inequality is the product of something called racism, whether institutional, historical, or structural, to say that is to violate the rules against post-racialism. Crenshaw says the current reality of racial relations in the U.S. echoes another backlash moment, the days after the brief era of Reconstruction that followed the Civil War. We don't remember, because it's not taught in our history books, that in the 19th century, there were black senators, there were black people in the House of Representatives, there were black elected officials in the states, there were black local elected officials. All of this was wiped out in a backlash moment that's not unlike this backlash moment that we have right now. Repeating the celebration about how far we've come and so how much we are happy that, gee, Glad we don't live back in a time like when Emmett Till got lynched and nobody was prosecuted. Glad we don't live in a time where Recy Taylor could be raped by the son of the sheriff and a gang of other people and no one would be prosecuted. Glad we don't live in a time where there are chain gangs and people are worked as slaves. Glad we don't live in a time where people live in communities where they're actually poisoned knowingly with no resort. Glad we don't live. And then you realize, okay, we do live in a period of time where those exact things are still happening. And the only thing that's different is that we have a framework that tells us that that's not what this stuff is about. That's what gets me beyond anxious. Because the worst thing to be said, in addition to material things happening that are like that, is when you don't have the language to actually call it out. If you cannot name it, you can't fix it. And if you can't fix it, then you basically have to live a life in sort of cognitive dissonance. Either I have to act as though this stuff isn't happening, or I act as though it is happening and I'm that angry black woman. The denial of history is plenty tough enough to overcome, but then post-racialism became a political cover for the denial of denial, a maddening hall of mirrors of cognitive dissonance. Crenshaw encountered just such a reality distortion field in an unexpected battle over one of her seemingly non-controversial school programs about the historical legacy of racism. My group has a video called The Unequal Opportunity Race. It's basically just a way of telling a story about how structures that were created 200 years ago allow assets to be passed on from generation to generation and disadvantages to be passed on. So it's basically people running around the track. The white runners can run and run and they can pass on their wealth. All the runners of color don't even get a green light until 1964. And then they start running, and as soon as they start running, they run into obstacles like segregation and, and racial profiling and, and poor schooling and housing discrimination, and all these make it hard for them to get around the track. This video has been shown across the country in a number of school districts for the last 15 years. This last year, it was shown in Virginia at a Black History Month celebration one of the fathers of one of the students took offense and went to Fox News to complain about it. The video then went viral and not in the way we wanted it to. And eventually this video was banned in this particular Virginia school as a racist video. So basically we're at a point where to talk about historical white supremacy, to talk about the contemporary dimensions of that history, is itself to be racist, not to talk about it, to let it continue, to let the material consequences of it shape our lives, that's okay. That's the contradiction that post-racialism has created for us. Kimberly Crenshaw came of age at the tail end of the civil rights movement in a family that was deeply invested in the quest for equal rights. The larger-than-life heroes of the civil rights movement inspired her to do the work she does today. She spoke with us at a Bioneers conference. We listened to the speeches on TV. We watched Martin Luther King. And we 
really admired those lawyers who we thought had some kind of magic spell, some kind of incantation that opened the doors to opportunity in society. So I wanted to be one of those lawyers. I wanted to learn what magic we could say before the law that would make the courts recognize that the way in which black people were being treated was unconstitutional. So I went to law school with the intention of being a a civil rights lawyer, part of the army of people who were continuing to demand social transformation. So that's what I went to law school looking for. I can't say that I found it there. Law isn't really about justice. Law is more, I think, accurately described as a rationalization strategy for legitimizing social inequality, for reinforcing the status quo, for turning what appears to be just sheer power into something that's logical and reasonable. And so at the end of the day, law puts a cover on social inequality. What I did learn, though, and that really informed the work that I do to this day, is that winners in legal cases are usually those who can tell the best story. As human beings, we're meaning-making creatures. Our brains are hardwired for story and metaphor. So when stories change, the world changes. Crenshaw found that dismantling structures of inequality requires that we learn to step into other people's stories and then see how our story changes. She needed to frame narratives about race and gender discrimination that would resonate with judges, judges who she found often dismissed cases simply because they didn't fit into their own frames of reference. A clear example was a case Crenshaw stumbled across from the 1970s called De Graffenreid versus General Motors. It was a story about a working mother and wife. Her name was Emma de Graffenreid. She, like many working mothers in the 70s, wanted to get a job in an auto manufacturing plant. That was a pretty good job in, in those days, a, a way to support her family. So she sought employment at GM, and she wasn't hired, and she believed it was because she was a black woman. So she sued. And a judge dismissed her case because actually GM did hire women and it did hire blacks. But the women that they hired were white women for front office jobs and secretarial work. And the blacks they hired were men for jobs on the floor, maintenance, heavy industrial work. So the judge did not think that Emma could prove that she'd experienced discrimination because, well, if they're hiring women and they're hiring blacks, how can you claim that you've been discriminated against? Well, the reality was that she was experiencing compound discrimination, but the judge thought that to allow her to put two causes of action together would give her preferential treatment. It seemed that sometimes one plus one equaled zero. If a judge's story was that compound discrimination meant preferential treatment because a combination of social identities was an unfair advantage, Kimberly Crenshaw realized a new story had to emerge. In the late 1980s, she developed a framework called critical race theory. It set off a movement that has gained increasing currency. In a pivotal 1993 article she wrote for the Stanford Law Review, Crenshaw introduced the concept of intersectionality. It was a framework for naming the crossroads of multiple experiences that were otherwise invisible to the many people not living that story up close and personal. Intersections are structured in ways where roads are coming together. They intersect with each other. So law is like the ambulance that comes to the scene and says, you know, I can't tell if they got hit on the race road or the gender road or the class road. You're not indemnified against accidents that happen when it's on all three. So we have nothing to say for you. And being able to explain it that way allowed people to see that where problems happen at converging sites and we don't have an analysis, we don't have a law, we don't have a movement, we don't have rhetoric to address that convergence, we've recreated the situation where the ambulance just drives away. 
So what do we need to do about the way we think about these things and the way we mobilize around these things? So nobody is left in an intersection simply because too many things happen to them rather than too few things happen to them. When we return, Kimberly Crenshaw shares how intersectionality serves as a prism through which we can see the full spectrum of human experience and social dynamics. She shows how we can design inclusive, holistic remedies that invite greater connection across our differences and create a new story together. This is Backlash Moment, converging at the crossroads of identity and justice. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. If you love Bioneers Radio, it's free and easy to support us. Just take a moment to post a review on our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our show online. You'll be helping other people find and enjoy these incredible thinkers and storytellers. And thank you for helping us out. Over the years, the intersectionality frame has primarily been a concept useful to academics and others who explore the convergence of social movements. But Crenshaw's driving interest is in its application. How do we transform compound discrimination into real-world justice for real people? She's helped create campaigns through the African American Policy Forum and through another organization she founded and directs, the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia University Law School. One such campaign is called Say Her Name. Crenshaw demonstrated what it's all about at a Bioneers conference. Okay, so everybody put one hand up. So I'm going to say some names. When you hear a name and you don't have a sense of who this is or what happened, put your hand down. Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. See, most of the hands are still up, right? Okay. Michelle Cousseau, Tanisha Anderson, Natasha McKenna, Ara Russer, Jessica Williams. When the list switched from men to women, most hands went down and stayed down. Crenshaw finds few people know the names of these women, even though, like the men, they were killed by police or died in prison under suspicious circumstances. She helped launch the Say Her Name campaign during the height of Black Lives Matter protests over police killing after killing of African Americans. Crenshaw was encouraged that at least the media were finally reporting on the pervasive police brutality and serial killings of black men and boys that seldom resulted in charges or convictions. But where was the outcry in the name of the murdered women and girls? Even within this powerful new social movement, there was little awareness of the devastating parallel reality. Only about 10% of women in the U.S. are black, but nearly 28% of all women shot and killed in the U.S. are black. We started looking at state violence and and realized not only that there was erasure around women being killed by the police, but just the very level of physical bodily violence Mm. that we were seeing being meted out against black women was appalling, appalling. So some of you may have seen the clip of the black girl in Spring Valley who was seated at her desk and a school resource officer came and literally threw her across the room. There's much more of those images. They are all over the place. Part of our trying to build public awareness is create the opportunities for people to see the things they don't want to see to be aware of the things that are happening that fall outside of their field of vision and to encourage people to to bear witness to it, not to just observe it, but to have that observation actually change their consciousness about social problems and to be able to think Now when we talk about state-sanctioned violence or police brutality, we're not just thinking about the men and the boys, but we're also thinking about the women and the girls. Or when we think about sexual abuse, we're not just thinking about stuff that happens on campuses, but we're thinking about things that happen in the back of police cars. We're thinking about strip searches of women on the side of the highway. We're talking about 
stripping 60, 70 year old women to humiliate them in police stations or sending black female defendants to court without pants. I mean, these are ways in which state humiliation has played out in women's lives and it hasn't been part of the way we think about gender justice, nor has it been a part of the way we think about race justice. To address this silent crisis, Crenshaw began connecting the dots to create coalitions at the crossroads of these otherwise siloed issues and communities. She collaborated on a groundbreaking event between the African American Policy Forum and V-Day, the organization created by the outspoken playwright and feminist Eve Ensler to end violence against women and girls. We co-sponsored an event in New York at the Lincoln Center that was designed to bring together two very distinct conversations. One, an anti-violence conversation that hadn't dealt with mass incarceration, and two, a mass incarceration conversation that hadn't dealt with women, and in particular, the fact that exposure to violence is one of the risk factors that leads women to become incarcerated. So we had an event in which we brought family members of formerly incarcerated women together and domestic violence advocates together for an evening of performance in which many well-known actors like Rosie O'Donnell and others performed pieces that were written by formerly incarcerated women in their own voices, talking about how exposure to violence, both physical and emotional, set the stage for circumstances that led them to be incarcerated. That was a moment where intentional intersectional thinking made a connection possible, brought these two constituencies together to build up both the anti-violence movement and the movement against mass incarceration. So it's possible. It just doesn't necessarily come naturally, given the frames that we have, which are already non-intersectional and partial. The African American Policy Forum also invited women of color to share their rarely heard stories in arts-based summer camps and public town hall meetings called breaking the silence. When you actually have town halls across the country and ask women and girls of color, what are the conditions of your life with respect to state violence, private violence, gentrification, school pushout, gender-specific burdens, sexual violence at home and in institutions, psychic violence, mass incarceration, criminalization. When you actually ask women to start telling you these stories, they have them. They've just never been asked. And they've never had the opportunity to tell the stories in contexts where people were seated there to listen and they're people who actually have responsibilities to the community. So we bring to the table elected officials, judges, thought leaders, ministers, people who organize organizations and have said, we didn't know. The idea is after this moment, you can never say you didn't know. But the women who've exposed themselves, many for the first time, we began to realize that that was just the beginning. What they needed was a sense of community and the fact that this was part of a national conversation. So we brought them together and provided opportunities to learn things that will help them continue to express um, their experiences. So people learning how to do pocket documentary, spoken word, dance, dramatic interpretation. And in this space, there's a recognition that, A, I'm not alone. This isn't a problem just in my community. And I can be my own advocate with the tools that, that I'm developing. So for us, it's a discovery, too, realizing how important the arts are to both healing and advocacy. There's an army out there of people who are thinking along this line. And our objective is to try to find networks where they come together and share their art with with many of the women and girls who are in desperate need of this kind of expressive support. Crenshaw's fierce efforts for inclusion at the crossroads are beginning to bear fruit. 
The once obscure word intersectionality is increasingly common in conversations that have now expanded to the other, whoever it may be, including the LGBTQ community and people with disabilities. I am encouraged by the many opportunities that we've had to actually figure out what does a full intersectional sort of conversation look like that actually elevates all these things at the same time. And yeah, I think we're at a moment where we're building that. I don't think we're anywhere close, but I think the acknowledgement that it's an important thing for us to equip ourselves to do is an important thing. Kimberly Crenshaw, Changing the World by Changing the Story, because there's light at the crossroads. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Producer, Teo Grossman. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Program engineer and music supervisor, Emily Harris. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest people of Cameroon and Baca Beyond. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest people through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Music From Memory Records at musicfrommemory.com and by Emotional Response Records at emotional-responserecords.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. This is program number 07 17. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley's pasture-raised organic dairy products, bringing the good from our family farmers to your table at organicvalley.coop, and by the generous support of listeners like you.